Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd and I just watched the first episode of the third season of Star Trek Picard and I have some mixed feelings about it. There are definitely some really good scenes, especially you know the exterior shots of some of the ships and the space docks. All of that looked uh, amazing and the music, they brought back some of the better music from the older movies and shows and a lot of the designs and all of that, uh, the interior shots are way too dark and there is no logical explanation to it. I guess maybe there are some Riemann crew members on the ship or uh, people from the Mirror Universe on the ship or something and that's why they cannot make it too bright inside the ship. Like, why not? Why cannot it be bright? There are scenes when Picard is standing on the bridge and I imagine him yelling There are no lights! And demanding to turn on the lights <laughs> to make it brighter. And unfortunately there's a lot of things in this episode which just doesn't really make a lot of sense. I have a few pages of notes about that stuff. And there's also some good attention to details, some good member berries. Uh, you know, in Picard's house there is the painting of the Enterprise D. There is his flute, there is that artifact, the one which he left on the Enterprise D, the one he threw away, even though he was so amazed by it when it was given to him by Professor Galen. And he was so amazed by it and then just left it on the Enterprise D, which always annoyed me. And in my head I always explain it away is that it was just a copy that he kept on the Enterprise D and the real one was in a museum by then and that's why he left it there because it was just a replicated copy. The real one was safe somewhere in a museum. So here we see the same kind of artifact on his desk so maybe it's another copy, maybe it's the real one this time. He didn't really forget about that artifact. So it kind of shows me that they are respecting the continuity a little bit more this time. And the chemistry between Riker and Picard was great. Hopefully when the other TNG character starts showing up we'll have the same kind of feeling that uh, it's the whole team back together and all of that. So hopefully it will be great. And it's funny how they got rid of pretty much almost all the new guys from the first two seasons. All the ones they tried to introduce to make it the new team. And it felt so miserably they got rid of pretty much all of them except for Rafi who shows up. And uh, Laris shows up briefly in the beginning of the episode. And we'll basically be waiting for Picard uh, till I guess the very end of the season when he comes to her planet because they were planning to move somewhere together to some Romulan planet. And so she just leaves for the rest of the season, which is kind of a continuity issue because you remember in the first season when Picard planned to go on a mission to save Soji's sister or something, how Lera says, you cannot go alone, it's too dangerous, we'll have to come with you. In the end she didn't come with him but she was so worried about him and yet in this season she's totally not worried that Picard is going off to some dangerous mission and meeting a woman that he once loved and all of that. She seems totally calm about it now so it doesn't seem like the same character that we saw in season 1. And uh, let's just go chronologically. Let's start from the beginning. The very first uh, scene is showing Beverly's, uh, I guess, civilian ship hiding in some nebula from some evil looking ships. And we hear an old song playing in the background, which kind of reminds me of those kinds of songs which I remember hearing in that uh, old computer game Fallout 1 and 2, which I was a big fan of as a kid. I think recently I heard the exact same song in Better Call Saul and so I'm not sure how relevant it is that we later find out that Picard is the one who gave her a compilation of those kinds of songs as a gift. So I guess it's to imply that she still cares about him. We also see her looking over his old uh, logs from the Enterprise and all of that. So I guess it's to imply that she still does care about him and so it's still a mystery why she decided to leave Picard. I'm guessing maybe it's because she's doing kind of illegal things outside the borders of the Federation, breaking the Prime Directive, maybe that's why she broke off with Picard because he didn't approve of that. Uh, will they have discussions about all those issues? I hope so, but I kind of doubt it. I keep raising hopes that maybe it will be like in TNG in which they actually debated some issues, some topic, either philosophical or political or ethical, a moral dilemma, something like that. Hopefully, I guess we'll wait and see. So why did she decide to keep uh, the child secret from him, assuming it is his child, which is not yet confirmed, I guess it will be. But uh, one theory is that maybe because she knew that uh, Picard has so many enemies in the galaxy that uh, they will want to take revenge by going after his child, just like what happened in that episode when that Ferengi Bok hunted down a supposed child of his with some woman which turned out to be fake. It wasn't really his son but he wanted revenge against Picard so much that he wanted him to think it's his son so that he can kill him to cause pain to Picard. So maybe Beverly remembers that incident and that's why she's hiding the child away from Picard and not knowing so that no one will know it. And so that's one theory. 
I guess we'll wait and see what the explanation is, but this episode really offered very little explanation about anything. We don't yet know what the big plot is, we don't yet know anything new really, and so it's all just a kind of a setup, so it's still a big question, will it all make sense in the end or not, because a lot of things in this episode are kind of iffy. So we see the ship being boarded by some masked aliens, and uh, for some reason she locked her son in some room so that he cannot help her fight off the invaders. So why, why not allow him to help as well? Wouldn't that increase their chances to survive? Instead she locked him away, I guess to protect him, but it doesn't really make sense because if she loses this uh, firefight in the corridor, then he's done for as well. So wouldn't it make more sense to allow him to help in the shootout as well? So all kinds of little things like that annoy me when it doesn't really make sense. Why did she lock him? And she's using a phaser rifle which for some reason works like a mechanical shotgun. She has to physically, mechanically reload it after every shot. And it even sounds and behaves like a shotgun. And yet it vaporizes people. And Dr. Crusher, who was always such a big humanitarian, is literally vaporizing people instead of stunning them. I guess maybe it will be explained later. Maybe it's the only way to kill these guys. Maybe their physiology doesn't allow for any other way to defeat them. Maybe stun setting doesn't work on them. And even when one of them lies wounded on the floor, she comes over him and vaporizes him while he's on the floor. So that doesn't really seem like the Dr. Crusher you'd expect. And so unless it gets explained later on that it was somehow necessary, this will make her look very bad, just like, you know, in season 1 of the show, Seven was vaporizing people instead of arresting them, just uh, out of vengeance and all of that, so unless this gets explained later on that it's the only way to defeat them, and so she's doing all, all of this out of self-defense, if it's not explained, then it will make her look like a murderer, because one of these guys was wounded on the floor, and she comes over and finishes him, and so... <laughs> That uh, is kind of iffy. There is a scene later on when Riker finds the remains of this dead body and says uh, these are strange looking ashes or something, so maybe that's a clue that these are not ordinary humanoids, maybe they are something strange which will be explained later on and maybe that's why she had to use the vaporized setting to protect herself and her kid and so on. So anyway, she gets wounded and has enough time to send a transmission to Picard of all people to come to rescue her, even though she knows Picard is a hundred year old man and she sends a transmission that can only be picked up by his old Enterprise D com badge which she assumes he will have near him somehow. What if it's in a museum? What if it's in some storage room, which he will not hear? So that was pretty stupid as well. If the fate of her kid depends on it, why doesn't she send it to some more reliable reason? Why not to some of her other TNG friends, like Worf or Riker directly? Like, why to Picard, who is a hundred year old man who might be dead from her point of view? She doesn't know anything. So how does she know he'll even receive it or be able to help her? But luckily, because he was just packing his uh, things uh, to move to some Romulan planet uh, with uh, Laris, that's why he happens to have the com badge uh, near him, and he's in the process of writing some letters with old ink for some reason, and he's wearing glasses, even though it's the 25th century now, and he's a robot, he's an android, and yet he has to wear glasses for some reason, I guess he's so old-fashioned, he just loves playing dress-up and play as if he's uh, in ancient times, as if he's in the far past, because he likes it so much, I guess that's the only explanation. So anyway, he hears the noise and he finds the com badge and he's wondering why it's receiving some transmission. So if he didn't keep this specific com badge around, then he never would have received the transmission and this whole season wouldn't have happened. So a really clever move by Beverly. So anyway, he looks at Beverly's transmission and she tells him, you cannot trust anyone, not even Starfleet, don't tell anyone. And the very next scene, he's talking with Laris, who is a former Tal Shiar agent, and he's telling her all about it, and apparently she saw the transmission, so I guess he trusts her, so it's okay. And the very next scene, he tells all of it to Riker, which also I guess he trusts him, so it's okay, but he's telling it to him in a room full of people right next to them. So he's talking about all of it openly, even though in the transmission she told him not to trust anyone, and yet he feels free to talk about all of this in a bar full of people. Apparently it's Guinan's bar, even though we don't see Guinan this time. And we see a bunch of ship models, including the Enterprise D. I guess the only time we'll see the Enterprise D was either in a painting or as a model. And the models themselves look exactly like today's models. Like I have the exact same model 
myself like it's exactly the same one with the same you know uh, plastic thing holding it and so how come in the 25th century they don't have better models with some uh, you know device to make it float without that plastic thing and so that also kind of took me out of it uh, to see my own model which i have myself and then they're discussing beverly's message and this is the most annoying dialogue in the whole episode in my opinion and i remember it's something that robert burnett praised as some brilliant writing and in my opinion it's the opposite it's uh, the silliest part of the whole episode when they say that uh, understanding the message depends on knowing about some computer virus which the enterprise d had while picard was locutus and so he doesn't know anything about it and they never properly explain what the hell they're even talking about it was never mentioned in tng itself in the show and why would Beverly send Picard the message telling him not to trust anyone and including in the message something which he wouldn't get because he didn't know about it. So why didn't she know that he wouldn't know about it? So it doesn't make sense. It all depends on Riker understanding what she means. And what computer virus? What the hell are they on about? Did the Borg implant a virus? Did they themselves make a virus to try to fight the Borg? Like why use it? in a message directed at Picard when Picard wouldn't get it and so nothing about this makes any sense unless it's later explained somehow and also this was a missed opportunity that's the most annoying thing about all of this because uh, he says that the virus caused the, the number three to be added to all the computers on the ship or something and so he takes the coordinates that Beverly sent Picard and he adds a, a three to all of them and then they get the right coordinates and so that's supposed to be some brilliant clever way so that no one else will figure out where are the real coordinates that she sent and only they will understand it but uh, again Picard wouldn't have known about it and also the missed opportunity is that why didn't they tie it with that episode when they were stuck in the time loop when Data was the one who added the number three to all the computers maybe Beverly should have sent the word Bozeman to Picard and then he will remember that incident and then he will figure out that he should add the number three to the coordinates to get the right ones so that would have been brilliant that would have been a nice member berry to that episode instead they tie it for some reason with uh, the Borg episode when Picard was locutus and so he doesn't even know anything about it and it was something that was never mentioned and the fact that they're talking about all of this top secret stuff in a room full of people who they don't know and the camera even implies one of those people is an evil spy who is eavesdropping on them and maybe it's a red herring but if it turns out that guy was actually eavesdropping it will make both of them look extremely stupid when Beverly tells you to keep things super secret and then you go and talk about it in an open bar so that really is annoying in my opinion and also Riker mentions that uh, he broke off with Troy, that uh, both Troy and his daughter Kestra will appreciate the time off from him and that's why he has time to go on this adventure with Picard. So why? Why do that? Why add this line kind of ruining the happy life that we saw him have uh, back in season one? That was my favorite episode of season one was the one in which they just casually go and meet Riker's family and we saw they live on a nice planet and all of that. That in my opinion was the most pleasant episode in season one the only one in which i had some fun watching it so why ruining it with uh, this line of dialogue that oh he broke off with his family his family doesn't like him anymore and all of that why why do that why make it more bleak and dark and then it cuts to the planet coruscant and we see Rafi is once again a junkie a drug addict roaming the streets of that planet in which everyone are using drugs apparently spraying it into their eye for some reason and people are smoking cigarettes or uh, death sticks including someone who looks like a bearded lady i'm not sure it's hard to tell anything in this darkness and uh, Rafi looks like she's a junkie again and so i was kind of rolling my eyes and then she bumps into some nasty guy who gets annoyed and he tells her something like you watch your step we're wanted men i have the death penalty on 12 systems something like that maybe i'm mixing it up with some other movie i'm not sure and uh, one of those guys looks kind of suspiciously similar to Gene Roddenberry and he kind of looks disapprovingly at Rafi being a junkie once again and then she goes to some sushi restaurant when an Orion guy is eating sushi or something with sticks and at least uh, he's a bold Orion just like Orion men used to be all bold in the past and then they forgot all about it in Star Trek Discovery so at least here it looks kind of slightly more appropriate to what it's supposed to be and he's apparently her drug dealer but uh, after that guy gives her some information she goes off to the street and suddenly she straightens out and uh, contacts her ship or something and apparently she's not really a junkie she was just pretending because she's undercover she's a spy for starfleet intelligence so that did feel kind of nice 
to be pleasantly surprised that uh, it's not really the same Rafi we saw in Season 1. It's an improved Rafi, so it's slightly better than I first uh, thought, but uh, they did kind of show that she is actually tempted to use that drug that was given to her, that she is tempted to use it, which is nice, you know, I like complexity in characters, I like the fact that she's, you know, still struggling with her issues and all of that, but she overcame them. So I did kind of like the ending of that scene, and she was given some information about some red lady and some imminent attack or something like that, it was kind of annoying how Rafi announces all of it in the middle of a street in which once again someone might be eavesdropping on her and so why break the cover before you're in your ship again? Like why announce in the middle of the street that you're actually Starfleet intelligence and not really a junkie and then leaving the drug on the floor for anyone to find and all of that? So that was slightly annoying. And then we see her back in the ship, uh, in the same ship we had in uh, season 1 and 2, which is now her ship for some reason. And she's contacting her boss in Starfleet Intelligence, and we don't know who that is yet, we only see a computer voice, which is a female computer voice, which I guess will be a surprise later on. I'm guessing it might be worth, because you know, one of the lines told to her is that you are a warrior and all of that, so it kind of sounded like worth, or maybe it will be someone else completely, maybe it's Bashir from Deep Space Nine or something like that. Because, you know, Bashir always wanted to play spy and all of that, so maybe he's now the head of Section 31, which I kind of hope is not the case. I did hear there are some ties to Deep Space Nine somewhere in this season, so I'm guessing this might be it. Maybe Worf and Rafi were both working for the same organization, same person or whatever, I guess we'll find out. But it kind of sounded as if it might be Worf. It would also be funny that Worf was using a female computer voice to disguise himself, but you can still see hints of it, like, you are a warrior and all of that. So anyway, they're looking for this red lady, and it turns out it's about uh, the statue of Captain Garrett, uh, the captain of the Enterprise C, and that's the location of the attack, which some terrorists are planning against Starfleet for some reason. And earlier, Rafi was telling the Orion guy that some super secret tech was stolen from the Daystrom Institute, something about quantum tunneling and all of that, and so when she arrived to that location with the red statue, we see a beam coming from the sky and collapsing that whole building with that statue deep underground and then we see a portal opening up above the city and the remains of the same building and we even see the red statue somewhere in there all falling down to the planet. So I guess that's the portal tunneling tech used to collapse cities and make them fall on it itself. Not really the most practical way to destroy cities. I guess there are so many weapons in Star Trek that can do so much more damage. So why is this such a, a big dangerous uh, thing, I'm not sure. It would be clever if they somehow tie it with that same portal which uh, Soji opened in the end of season 1 to try to bring those robot tentacles uh, through if uh, that antenna she built was somehow reverse engineered by the Daystrom Institute and that's the technology which they stole and so if they somehow tie to that, I think it will be clever. I personally don't like the fact that they left all those loose ends open. Like, what happened with those robot tentacles? Why can't they come to our galaxy by their own? What about that portal that opened in the end of season 2 with that giant beam that almost destroyed all life in the galaxy which the good Borg tried to stop together with Starfleet? Was that somehow all tied together? I guess we'll find out. I kind of hope it is because I don't like loose ends. I don't like that they left all those cliffhangers uh, in the end of each season and then we never find out what happened next and so I would be annoyed by that so it would be clever if they say that this quantum tunnel in tech is the same one they recovered from that antenna which those androids try to use to bring the robots from the other galaxy into our galaxy or something so at least uh, like a small mention of that would be nice I think so in the whole episode we don't yet find out who the new bad guys are, what do they want, why do they do these terrorist attacks against Starfleet locations, who are the guys chasing Beverly around, we don't know anything yet, so we heard something from being stolen from Daystrom, maybe the remains of Lore were also there, maybe that's why he'll be later on in this season. So anyway, we see Picard and Riker are plotting to basically steal a ship to go and rescue Beverly because they cannot openly talk about it with Starfleet, which is also not yet explained why can't they trust Starfleet. So I personally am kind of hoping for those conspiracy bugs to show up because that's another loose end from way back in season 1 of TNG. That was actually one of my favorite episodes as a kid, the one about those bugs going into people and taking over them. And they kind of ended that episode with a distress signal which the Remick Queen creature sent into some unknown corner of the galaxy and they ended the episode with kind of a creepy music and all of that, uh, hearing that signal that they might be coming later on in the future and all of that. 
And so if they actually continue it in this season, I'll actually personally kind of be satisfied because that's something I always wanted to see. I wanted to see a continuation of that, resolving that cliffhanger. So maybe the conspiracy bugs are once again trying to take over Starfleet. And you know, in that scene when Riker and Picard board the, the USS Titan, we see all the ensigns standing in the corridors, but one of them kind of looks uh, kind of in an evil stare at them. After they pass, he kind of has the evil look in him, and, and the camera kind of focuses on him for some reason. So maybe again, it's a red herring, or maybe it's a clue that that guy was actually working for the bad guys. Maybe he's one of the spies and all of that. So I guess we'll wait and see. And uh, so because they cannot trust anyone in Starfleet, they're planning to basically hijack this ship and so they go into the starbase which at least the starbase looks like it's supposed to it's not the same exact design as the space dock in the movies but it is very similar and it is kind of beautiful and we have the shot of picard and Riker flying in the shuttle inside the starbase and it looks just like in the old movies with the same kind of music and all of that so all of those scenes were uh, visually great i like them and their dialogue is good. Their plan, however, is kind of stupid. It relies basically on sheer luck. It just happens that Seven of Nine is the first officer of the ship and it's only thanks to her that their plan even works. So the whole plan kind of sucks and is stupid. Like, wouldn't it be easier to simply contact Jordi or Worf or someone like that that they know and trust and get a fast ship from them instead of trying to trick a Starfleet captain who they know won't like them because, you know, Riker tells Picard about him. He knows that he's an a-hole and all of that. So their whole plan depends on somehow tricking the captain to take the ship into some location which they want to go to, which is close to the border where Beverly sent the distress signal from and all of that. So... This whole plan is kind of stupid and so that's also disappointing and then they come aboard the bridge of the ship and the captain doesn't even greet them it's only seven of nine and another strange thing is that the titan was uh, completely refitted into a totally different looking ship i have no problem with the look of the ship itself i think it's kind of obviously inspired by the older enterprise they even say it's a newer constitution class something like that so it's deliberately similar to Kirk's Enterprise, and yet it's the Titan, which we saw in Lower Decks, and it looks completely different, like a completely different shape of the ship. So apparently the ship was completely rebuilt from scratch into a totally different shape of a ship, so why, why not just make it a different ship? And I think they should have simply said it's the new Enterprise. It would have made more sense instead of insisting it's the Titan, even though it looks nothing like the Titan we saw in Lower Decks. And it would also make more sense because they can say, you know, the Enterprise is the flagship, so that's why it's the quickest ship in the fleet. And so that's why it's the ship they need to get to save Beverly in time. And also it will make sense for their cover story that they want to visit the new Enterprise because they served on the two previous Enterprises. And so that's why they want to visit the new Enterprise. And so, and also why the ship is refitted to look like an older Enterprise because it is an Enterprise. And so... It would have made so much more sense, but I guess they're saving the name for the end of the season. Maybe only in the end of the season they will see the new Enterprise and all of that. But I think this should have been the Enterprise and not the Titan. I have no problem with the design itself, by the way. It is a kind of interesting looking. It is similar to the older ship while also looking new at the same time. And seeing the inside of the Starbase, the space dock looking exactly like uh, in the movies, that was great as well. And then they come to the bridge and then one of the ensigns there, the one at the helm, kind of grins at them strangely and then they discover that's Jordi's daughter and that part kind of <laughs> made me roll my eyes because I was thinking isn't this the exact same scene that we saw in Generations when they meet Sulu's daughter I have expected Picard to whisper in Riker's ear when did Jordi have time for a family I thought he's only into holographic chicks when did he have time to find an actual wife wasn't he always bed with the ladies and then Riker will say, when something is important, you make the time. And then Picard will say to LaForge's daughter, it wouldn't be a starship without a blind person at the helm. Uh, sorry, without a LaForge at the helm. Something like that would have been funny. And you know, the fact that they poked fun at her for uh, her nickname in the Academy being uh, Crash LaForge because she kept crashing shuttles. And so I immediately thought, wait, is she blind too? Is she part blind because LaForge is her father? Wasn't him being blind genetic? So wouldn't he pass it to his daughter? So I guess she's blind too. So why doesn't she have a visor or something? That would have immediately made her recognizable as his daughter if she also had a visor. So <laughs> that would have made it too silly, of course. But uh, the fact that this scene was so similar to that scene from Generations was a little bit distracting because I kept thinking, you know, a lot of the good stuff in this episode is basically recycled stuff from the old movies and shows. Some of the good scenes, like them watching the ships from the shuttle, 
and this scene meeting a daughter of a former crew member all of that was kind of too similar to some good scenes we had in the past only then they were original and here it's not really original it's basically a remake of the same ideas in a new way but there is no real originality to them and so that kind of annoys me a little bit I guess maybe it's deliberate, maybe it's supposed to be this way, you know, like a poetry, so that it rhymes and all of that, like George Lucas used to say. So then Seven orders the ship to leave the space dock, and again, visually it's beautiful, I love the fact that, you know, the gates of the space dock look exactly like in the movies, and the music is great, and the ship looks great from the outside, from the inside it's way too dark in my opinion. And only then they go and meet the captain who is dining in his uh, room, and uh, he didn't even wait for them to arrive before he starts eating. And right from the start, uh, they show us that he's kind of an a-hole, that he doesn't really like them. And that, again, kind of reminds me of season one, when everyone used to hate Picard for some reason, which doesn't really make sense, because when you meet a living legend, someone who literally saved not just your planet, but uh, the whole galaxy and the whole universe like 10 times over, and you treat him like that, doesn't really make much sense, even if you disagree with some things he did, but uh, he's still kind of a legend, he's still someone you would admire and respect at least, and he is an admiral and all of that, and yet everyone treats him like some annoying guest that uh, they don't want around. Like, wouldn't you treat him like a celebrity at least and all of that? That's the kind of stuff that annoyed me in season one, that everyone hates Picard, and so this captain also hates Picard. Maybe it's because he's former Borg drone, they did mention that when he tells Seven, you should be loyal to the ship and not to your friends and the former Borg drones and all of that, so I guess maybe later on they'll reveal maybe he lost someone at Wolf 359, and that's why he dislikes Picard, just like Cisco disliked Picard for that reason, because he kind of subconsciously viewed him as guilty for that and all of that and so maybe they'll explain all of this later and uh, that will explain why he's acting this way but uh, it's kind of the same vibe as season one that Starfleet is evil you know it made sense back in TNG when the show just started that often they would have all these evil admirals who boss them around and don't respect them and all of that but that was before they saved the whole galaxy a bunch of times you know so it made sense back then it doesn't really make sense now after everyone knows about them, they should be like celebrities who everyone knows uh, saved uh, all the galaxies so many times and all of that, and yet they treat them like dirt for some reason. That doesn't really make much sense, and it's kind of annoying to me. I guess this character is supposed to be interesting, and so they are deliberately setting up this conflict. And maybe one way to excuse it is to say that maybe he simply figured out right from the start that they are up to something, that they are plotting to do something, and that's why he's being this way and all of that, so... If that's the case, it will make it better, and it was funny how he put them in a small room and they have bunk beds, because he says, we had such short notice for your arrival and all of that, so he puts them in a small room deliberately to kind of humiliate them, so it is kind of silly, but it is kind of funny at the same way, so I can forgive it. It kind of reminds me of that scene from TNG when uh, Picard and Data were on a Klingon ship, and the Klingon captain was being annoying, and so he also deliberately put them in a small room together with one bed and all of that. So I'm fine with these kind of silly things if it's actually comedic. If it is actually funny, then I can't forgive it. And so I have some mixed feelings about this new captain, Captain Shaw. And uh, the show that he's kind of a super by the book, that he doesn't take orders from them, only from his actual superiors. And so just because there's famous celebrities, he's not going to abide by their wishes. And so their whole plan completely collapses because they don't know what to do now, he just doesn't want to listen to them, and only because luckily Seven of Nine is now the first officer, that's what saves the whole situation, because she secretly changes the course to where they wanted to go while the captain is asleep, and then he wakes up when he hears the thunderstorm outside the ship, which is kind of silly, I talked about this many times, how in all the new Star Trek shows, all the nebulas are shown as if they are clouds in the sky with lightning storms which you can hear somehow from the window and all of that stuff is kind of annoying because it doesn't make sense and if the captain did suspect them of doing plotting all kinds of things like that then why did he go to sleep why didn't he personally keep an eye on what's going on if he suspected something so it doesn't really make much sense Maybe all of this is the reason that Jordi is angry at Picard later on, you know, I made a whole theory video to try to explain it before I see the actual show of why Jordi is angry at Picard, but maybe it will end up just being because Picard uh, did this uh, stunt in this episode, so that will be disappointing, I think, because I keep expecting some more clever and complex, you know, personal differences 
about ethical issues. You know, I suggested that maybe Jordi is angry at Picard because Picard is the one who helped Data commit suicide back in season one and Data was his best friend and all of that. So I thought that would be an interesting reason. But I'm guessing now that it's just because Picard uh, pulled the stunt to try to get to Beverly without talking with Starfleet and all of that. So maybe that's why Jordi is annoyed by Picard and all of that. So anyway, there's still a shuttle to go and save Beverly and uh, Riker is kidnapped by her son who then lowers his weapon and then Riker elbows him right in the face which was kind of unnecessary and uh, this again shows the violence in these new Star Trek shows it's not uh, as enlightened like in TNG you know it's something I like in TNG even though it might seem childish and silly but in TNG they were always trying not to be too violent you know the phasers were just stunning people except those rare occasions when the stun setting simply wouldn't work and so you end up vaporizing someone or if it's by accident you vaporize someone but it's never the intent of the heroes to kill even bad guys they will always try to stun them and arrest them and when uh, Riker was fighting someone he always used that uh, open palm technique of punching someone with the palm of his hand and not with a fist or an elbow so it seemed like a more gentle way of knocking someone out without causing serious damage and yet here he just elbows that guy in the nose and somehow that guy is totally fine so it seems kind of way too violent for what TNG used to be so it doesn't really feel like coming back to the TNG style unfortunately and so Beverly was vaporizing people even people who got knocked out she comes over and vaporizes them you know here Riker does kind of examine the ashes and says that something looks off about it so maybe we'll have an explanation later on but so far everything looks kind of dark and bleak just like in all the new Star Trek shows like Discovery and the previous seasons of Picard and there's too many silly things which don't make sense especially that message from Beverly which is somehow sent to his combat which just by pure luck he was able to hear it and for some reason she put clues in for something that he wouldn't know about about some virus which the Enterprise had while he was Locutus so why did she think that he will know about it and it was a missed opportunity as always in the new shows like why not tie it with that episode when Data programmed the computer to add threes to everything then it will be a perfect fit for the dialogue because they needed to add the threes to the coordinates to get the real coordinates and so that was a missed opportunity so these kind of things are annoying me when the writing is not really that clever which really makes me worried so i have mixed feelings on this episode my ranking would be probably six out of ten so that's my opinion let me know what you think and we can discuss about all of this in the comments below and i will see you all next time bye bye